morning. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, welcome back. And um, yeah, we're in our closing weeks of the semester. Hope you're all doing well. Um, let's just begin with prayer. Would someone please open us in prayer? Jesus, we thank you for this um, day. And uh, Lord, as we're about to begin our classes, I pray that um, we will learn something new today. We'll be inspired. We, we, mo we would be motivated to carry out um, the revival, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, for and that we just have a good time in class. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you. So, um, any... Um, anyone had any questions on the assignments just before we go into class? Okay, I hope you'll have started work on. <laughs> okay, so if you'll have any questions, please feel free to email me. I mean, in class as well, you're welcome to ask your questions. Um, that may be the best way. Uh, can you please clarify the second question? Okay, so this is in the final paper, right, Sri Radha? Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, the second part of the question, uh, compare the points mentioned with the revival from chapter 5 or the revi revival you presented on, uh, right? So uh, when we're looking at chapter 8 in our textbook, um, it talks about some of the typical things we see uh, in a revival or like as we've looked through all of these revivals, chapter 8 provides kind of a summary of uh, what all we've seen happen in these revivals. Um, I'm just going to chapter 8, sorry, yeah. Um, so uh, some of the points we looked at last week uh, was, let's see, Christ. Okay, so one of the points we looked at uh, last week, uh, just as an example, was uh, looking at the heart condition uh, while you're preparing for revival or while you're praying for revival. Um, so uh, it talks about here are heart conditions that we must maintain personally, a heart that is humble, a heart that is hungry, a heart that is passionate and persistent, a heart that is compassionate. Um, so as you're summarizing, so you you say you've, you've put all of these points down as this is the kind of heart we should have as we are praying for revival. And then you look at a specific revival. Um, if it is the revival you presented on, um, then you look at the revivalist who was used in that revival and look at did we see this did we did was there a, a humility displayed was there a hunger for god that was displayed uh, so just to take these points and uh, look at a specific revival either which you already presented on or one of the revivals we looked at in chapter 5 because that chapter has the revivals in more detail uh, you can choose either one and uh, look at these points and see how uh, we see. You may not see all the points because all of that information may not be available or um, we, yeah, we might not know so much in detail about the revivalist. So whatever you do see in the revivalist, you talk about uh, from these main points. So... Uh, if you presented on, uh, say, William Seymour, uh, how did he display a heart of humility? Uh, how did he display a hunger of God? So he was spending uh, 
some three and a half hours in prayer, I think. And then he started to spend five hours in prayer daily. So that is a display of how much he was pursuing God. Um, yeah. Does that, is that clear? Does that answer your question? Yeah. OK, so yeah, just to summarize those main points in the chapter and then look at a specific revival, uh, either the one you presented on or from chapter 5, and see how much of those points we see in the, in the revival you're looking at. Um, yeah, kind of talk about that based on those points. So we'll go back to <clears throat> chapter 7, which is where we were. Oh, you have a question? You all have a question? Go ahead and ask, because... Um, okay, the question is whether you can get extended time. Uh, yeah, so you'll also have a quiz after this. So that's why I gave you an early deadline. Yeah, so that I can post the quiz in the last two weeks of the semester. Uh, if you feel you need more time, just let me know. Uh, if you can submit it, so due 11th November is like this Saturday. This Saturday afternoon, Indian time. Okay. Uh, Yeah, so, so what, yeah, so Sri Dada said we need only one day for quiz. Yeah, I just wanted to post it early so that depending on whenever you all are free, because I know you all have other assignments, you all can do the quiz whenever uh, you want to do it. Uh, you need a little more time. OK, so we'll, um, so this is due on the 11th. Um, let me see. Shall I give you all till the 14th? Yeah. Okay, so that's Tuesday, uh, the 14th. Okay, uh, that will also give me time to correct it because I need to correct your assignments before the end of the semester. So I'll, I'll change that then to the 14th. Okay, so it'll be 14th afternoon for on Indian time and then. 14th night uh, UTC. OK. <laughs> OK, so let's go to our class. I'll just keep this open. OK, so we were looking at chapter 7, which talks about revival in our day. Um, kind of, we looked at why is there need for revival, what are some hindrances to revival, and then what are some signs that a revival is really a revival? How do we know that what is happening is really a move of God? Uh, so we covered all of that last week. Um, today we will talk about um, what can we expect God to move in our midst in our present day, and if so, what should we be preparing for, or how can we prepare for it? Uh, so, if someone can open First Corinthians three nine a, uh, so just that first part of First Corinthians three nine.
Well, we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. Okay, so that's just a reminder that uh, even as we're seeking for revival, uh, we are fellow workers with God. So it is a sovereign move of God. We believe that uh, whatever that happens in revival is truly God's spirit doing something that is beyond what we can do. But at the same time, we also... Uh, as fellow workers know that there are things that we can be doing to prepare ourselves, uh, ways in which we can conduct ourselves even in the midst of a revival to allow God to freely move and to continue uh, what God starts in our midst. Um, so a few things uh, we uh, look at is God can use any time. Uh, so when we looked at all of these different uh, stories of revival. There were times that we looked at how the church was really going through spiritual decline or society itself, there was moral decline in society. Uh, and at those times, people started to seek God and God moved. Uh, so uh, it doesn't have to be that there is a great spiritual uh, condition of the people or the church, but at the same time, there were times when people were seeking God earnestly and seeking for God to move, and that's when God moved. So it's not dependent on the moral condition or the spiritual condition of the people. God can move in either way, as long as there is somebody who is earnestly seeking him to move. Um, the amount of time that is spent in prayer, so the duration of sowing in prayer. So in some of these revivals, we saw that uh, there were years spent in prayer before there was a move of God. In some cases, there were months. Uh, in some cases, it was about a year. Like if we looked at the Shalom revival, it was a year of praying before revival happened. Uh, some places was longer, some places was shorter. So uh, the amount of time in prayer also varies between revivals. Uh, the place God chooses. So God, we've seen revivals happen in cities, in small towns, in college campuses, in churches, uh, just in the public place. So in all kinds of places, it could happen anywhere. It doesn't have to start within the church. And it doesn't have to start in a big city. It can be in some place that's completely insignificant. Uh, so wherever we are, we can expect that God could move from there, uh, even if it's a small place to impact the world. Um, the people God uses. So God always didn't always use a preacher or a pastor. He used people who were not known, like in the layman's fellowship, it was common people who were just meeting for prayer. Uh, so, or it was young people, it was older evangelists, like all kinds of people that God used. There's no specific kind of person that God used. Uh, then what ignites that fire that actually starts the uh, revival? So in some places it was preaching, in some places it was prayer, in some places it was one person, in some places it was a church. So it can be different things that actually spark the fire of revival. Um, and the last is the manifestation of the outpouring. So the way in which the Holy Spirit moves can differ from revival to revival. Um, in some places we just saw a lot of like uh, conviction of sin, repentance, restoration, that kind of uh, change in people's heart. In some places it was more physical manifestations of the Holy Spirit, uh, especially in the later revivals we see a lot of that, uh, where there was more um, like, more like laughter or falling down in the spirit, um, those kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> but we'll, we'll look at the example of the Toronto Blessing. So the Toronto Blessing, um, Toronto is in Canada. And uh, why we're looking at that, uh, that revival is because it's considered one of the most impactful uh, recent revivals. It has impacted a lot of present day churches. Um, including Bethel and um, a lot of other like charismatic Pentecostal churches. So we are looking at their example. What were some things we can learn from this 
uh, this revival, uh, some things that we can take away from it for ourselves as people who hopefully want to see revival happen in our midst as well. Uh, so the first is desperation for divine intervention. So uh, we see the pastors of this church in Toronto. Um, they were John and Carol Arnett. So they were from the Vineyard Church. And they, uh, as well as Pastor Randy Clark, he was also from the Vineyard Church. We'll go back to their stories. We covered it already in that whole timeline of stories. But we covered a lot of people. And I'm sure you all have... You all don't remember these stories specifically, so we'll look again at their stories. Um, but what happened with them was that they were personally desperate for a move of God, like for themselves and for their congregations. And because of that, God moved. Uh, so that is one thing to, uh, for us to have that kind of desperation to see God move powerfully in our midst. Uh, if we don't have that, then we won't pursue it. And then we will not uh, see God respond to that desire within us. Um, the second is uncommon acts of spiritual uh, devotion. So uh, in this, this same example, uh, they changed their schedules. They set aside more time for prayer. Uh, they for personally waiting on the Lord in prayer. Uh, not only in this example, but so many revivals, that was one key factor, right? That there was time being set apart to seek the Lord, uh, whether it was uh, an individual or in community, that was in every revival. I don't think there's even a single revival we looked at where that didn't happen. Um, the third is impartation from revival leaders. So um, John and Carol Arnett, who were the pastors of the church in Toronto, they went to a Benny Hinn crusade, uh, and that's where they actually first saw the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, saw a little more about the Holy Spirit uh, and how uh, the Holy Spirit manifests in meetings and all of that. From there, they traveled to South America, uh, to meet uh, Pastor Claudio Friedzen. So he was uh, a pastor in Argentina, and they were seeing revival there. So they went to meet him, and he prayed over them. And then they invited Randy Clark, who was seeing revival happen in his church. They invited him to their church, and that's when the revival started in their church. So they recognized that people who were leading revivals were people they could learn from. And so they sought after prayer. They went, they like actually traveled to places to meet these revival leaders, to learn from them, to receive impartation from them. Uh, so uh, we'll, I'll just talk a little bit about their story so we understand uh, what all happened with them. Uh, so in this is this happened in '92, where there was a revival in uh, Argentina, and Claudio Friedzen was the pastor there. So he was personally seeking the Holy Spirit, and he was impacted by the Holy Spirit. And then through him, revival started spread in his church, and from his church to the rest of Argentina. So hearing about this, Randy Clark, who was a pastor in the Vineyard Church in the U.S. Uh, went to meet with this pastor, and he was prayed over by him. He he prayed over him over five times, and as he prayed over him, uh, he was touched by the Holy Spirit. He went back to his church, and his church was powerfully impacted because he himself experienced the Holy Spirit. He took back that power to his church. And so uh, this uh, these pastors, Carol and... Um, her husband, John Arnett, uh, they invited Randy Clark to their church. So they had also been seeking revival. They had gone and received a prayer and a powerful impact, impartation from another leader. Um, but they believed that that was also for the church, not only for them personally. And so they invited Randy Clark to lead in some revival meetings. And as he was sharing about what was happening in his church, it sparked revival in Toronto. And then from Toronto spread to the rest of the world. And so uh, we see here that they were, they made so many sacrifices. They like went after revival for their church. Uh, and so they took 
what was happening in these places, they were encouraged by it, and they started to seek it out for themselves, for their church. Um, the, la oh, the fifth thing is follow revival until, until revival follows you. So the same thing. They went to all of these revivals. They learned from what was happening. They then started to try and like bring that back to their church uh, and the last is they not only did that for themselves but then they sent people from their church to other parts of the world to take revival so once revival happened in their church they sent uh, people from the church to other parts of the world and that's how revival spread uh, across the globe from toronto so how can a local church prepare uh, for for God's move. Um, if someone can open Luke 14, 28 to 30. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and it is and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Thank you. So uh, there are two things uh, from this passage, Luke 14. Uh, it's talking about being prepared. So right when we are pursuing revival, we also want to be prepared for revival. We want to uh, know that once God answers that prayer of our hearts, uh, once God responds to that hunger and thirst that we pursue him with, are we then ready to steward what God does? Right. If we are not ready to steward, it's going to just be we are personally impacted, or our church is personally impacted, and then it dies out. Uh, so these are two things that we learn from other revivals where they kind of made mistakes or where they did something well. Uh, two ways in which we should prepare is prepare people and to pursue in prayer. Uh, so we see in the um, Azusa Street Revival, that there was a lot of uh, strife that came in between the leadership. So it was a powerful move of God. It was uh, led by William Seymour, and he was so passionate for God. It was mostly his hunger for God that uh, led to God moving through him powerfully and then impacting so many people. But what happened was as other people came in and other people started to serve, uh, there was competition that came in between the leaders. So some people who came in, they spent a few weeks in the revival and then they thought, I can do this better. I'll go and start a revival somewhere else. And then one of the main leaders who was in the Azusa Street Revival took their contact list and went away and said uh, that the revival is now moved to another part uh, of the US. And so uh, that kind of... Um, strife within the leadership uh, broke down what God had started there. Right? It was a powerful, it had a powerful impact on the world, but that church itself finally was closed down. Uh, the church itself died out. William Seymour continued to pastor it till the end. But uh, what had grown so powerfully from 15 people to 1,500 people to around the world, again, ended up being a very small congregation at the end. And the church closed after William Seymour's wife pastored it till her death. And then the church closed. Um, so uh, addressing these issues of competition, uh, of strife, of disunity, all of those things to address it, but also to prepare people's hearts that we are seeking revival for the glory of God. It's not for personal glory, for personal gain, for our ministry or our church or whatever it is. It is for the glory of God. And so uh, our names or our ministry doesn't matter, right? Uh, we'll do whatever it takes to see God's work accomplished. And um, as long as that remains the main focus, then we uh, there's less likelihood of people starting to fight over who's the leader or trying to take over all of those things. Uh, another revival where we see uh, some strife come in is the yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so, um, yeah, so uh, the question is, can we look at it as uh, something that is not dependent on the leadership, uh, but completely on God? So you're saying for revival to start or for the work to continue? For revival to start, for the work to continue. So definitely the Azusa Street Revival still has an impact, has had an impact on today's church, right? So what God did definitely had an impact. But how could the people have been better uh, stewards of what God was doing so that um, so that that work could have been continued to be fruitful, especially for their church, or they could have continued to be a church that was impacting the world. Um, so from that perspective, so God will do what he wants to do. And the church has been transformed through that revival because uh, there's just a new understanding of the Holy Spirit's presence uh, in the church today, what God wants to do through the church today. Uh, that is definitely true. Um, but the fact that that church itself closed down uh, is it means that, OK, there was opportunity for them to continue the work. What could they have done to continue it? Right. So um, just from that perspective, like if we've started ministries or if we are leading groups, we want to see that work continue, right? We don't want to see at some point that this whole thing closes down and um, yeah, and it no longer has an impact on the world. Whatever we are doing, we want to like pass on to our leaders. We want it to pass on to generations, ideally. Uh, so from that perspective, how can we, uh, how can we steward that well? Is the thing. Um, so yeah, there's another example um, from the Brownsville uh, Assembly of God that was in Florida. Again, here, the leadership started. There was broken relationships between them and uh, some of the leaders of their school of ministry. Uh, and so, again, some of the work that the Holy Spirit was doing was kind of quenched because of those relationships. So that's the thing, uh, the quenching of the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, are we opening ourselves up more to the Holy Spirit moving in our midst, or are we kind of uh, closing down the move of the Holy Spirit in our midst? That's the question, I think. Um, so some ways in which we can prepare people is uh, what uh, we talked about already, is uh, to put away strife any desire for recognition, desire for position. The second is to become kingdom-minded. Um, we have two passages there. First Corinthians 3, 3 to 9. Yeah, First Corinthians 3, 3 to 9. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3 to 9. For you are still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mermen? For when one says, I am of Paul and another, I am Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted Apollos, watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building, according to that grace of God which was given to me 
as a wise master builder i have laid the foundation and another builds on it but let each one take heed how he builds on it and john 4:35 to 38 Do you not see there are still four months and a half? And I was, behold, I say to you, this is the end of one eyes and look at me, but they are already high. And he will see two spaces, and that is two for the third and the fourth. But both he is the first, and he who comes may rejoice at it. For the end is, the saying is true. One house, one source, and another is. I sent you to eat the food which you have not tasted. Others have tasted. Who have entered? So, um, from being kingdom-minded, it's to recognize that we all just have a small part to play. and uh, our goal is to build god's kingdom so whatever work we are doing we are only just contributing a small part we are either sowing we are reaping we are uh, we are part of the harvest whatever it is we are doing uh, it's god who has caused the growth it's god who is actually Uh, made our work fruitful. Who's given us the grace to do the work? Who's entrusted the work to us? Uh, so to have that perspective, to prepare people to have that perspective, uh, that even as we are seeking God to move in our midst, um, our our whole focus is on God's glory, on building His kingdom, uh, and just recognizing that all of us are part of that one goal. Whatever we are doing, we're working as one towards that goal uh the second is to focus on uh the third is to focus on god's presence not program so um while we have our uh regular church calendar or our plans for the church uh our agendas for the church always to be seeking out the presence of god uh that that is the main goal Uh, we don't get busy like Martha, just doing the work and uh, doing the tasks, sticking off everything on the checklist. Uh, but it's about all of those things being uh, things um, that take us into the presence of God. Those are just tools to take us into the presence of God. So that is the main goal. That's what we're seeking after. Um, to equip the next is to equip people to disciple new believers so this is very important we see in the bibles that people were coming to faith in thousands and 10000s uh, what kind of preparation was there to receive new believers right what kind of um, we don't like we didn't look into in that much detail at these revivals but that is something for us to consider if people are coming to faith in that way uh are we prepared to then actually help them grow in maturity or are they going to come in and bring their immaturity bring uh so much of the world into uh the church and will the church then become spiritually weak or spiritually diluted uh instead are we going to bring those new believers into a place of maturity and raise them up to be strong new believers uh so that is something we can just look at the new testament and see that is a very real challenge right so in the epistles uh we see uh see uh paul we see peter we see them addressing young believers who had to understand how to live out their faith uh because they didn't know right and so that is something for us to be prepared for do we have the tools do we have people who can mentor who can disciple who can raise up strong mature believers um another is to equip people to have this mindset of pioneering to go out and take the revival to other places uh, so to raise up such strong leaders uh, who are bold enough to step out 
when the time comes. Now, part of this is we raise them up, like we prepare them. We, uh, like Paul mentored Titus and Timothy, uh, having that kind of a thing where we're mentoring younger uh, people who are coming into ministry. Uh, but the other thing is it has to be also the Holy Spirit empowering them, right? It has to be both and. So recognizing those who God has called, recognizing new uh, believers or recognizing new ministers that God is raising up, and then us doing the job of mentoring them, preparing them uh, to do the work when the time comes. Um, the next is to be ready to make changes to accommodate God's moves. So uh, doing things that we are uncomfortable with, changing our schedules, changing the way we do things. Um, a lot of the times we see, uh, especially in the Azusa Street Revival, we see that their services were very spontaneous. There was no plan schedule for the service. Right? So that is something that can be uncomfortable because we have our usual order of service. We want to follow it the way we do it, have the, the worship, the announcements, the sermon, whatever. Um, but to come to, in, in the context of a revival, to be flexible uh, and say, allow God to just move the way he wants to move, the Holy Spirit to move. Um, then prepare leadership teams uh, to be able to step out. So... Uh, this is where, like, even though you're the pastor, being willing to do work that may not be part or what is typical of the pastor in the context of revival where there's extra work, there's extra responsibilities, everyone has to be willing to pitch in and step into each other's roles if needed. So that is another thing where we're not going to hold on to our titles and positions and say, because I'm the leader, I won't do this other work but to be willing to do whatever is needed so that the work gets done. Um, so apart from pre uh, preparing people, uh, the other thing we need to do is to pursue in prayer. Um, that's another way to prepare our congregations for revival. So to encourage personal prayer for revival, encourage small groups to meet for prayer, uh, and then to call for corporate prayer in all these contexts. So uh, to first inspire individuals to seek revival, uh, to then encourage small groups to gather and pray for revival, and then as a church as well to be gathering and seeking uh, God's move in our midst. So all of those things uh, will prepare us, prepare each person within the congregation, but prepare the congregation as a whole as well uh, for God's move. So um, the, so when we talk about uh, revival in our present day, we talked about God's presence and God's glory being uh, the heart of God for the church. Uh, and that's what we're seeing a greater focus on in a lot of churches now, that that is something that is being taught about, that something is being pursued. Uh, so we look at a few scriptures. Um, so Habakkuk 2.14, if someone could read that for us. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So that is God's promise, right? That his glory will fill the earth uh, just as much as there's water covering the earth, there will be the glory of the Lord covering the earth. Uh, so that is something that God himself desires to do and we... Uh, when we are asking for revival, we are aligning with God's desire, aligning ourselves with God's desire and asking that we will be instruments through which God's glory uh, is present on the earth, through which God's glory uh, is spread through the earth. Um, we look at Isaiah. Isaiah 61 to 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and the deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your 
rising. So Isaiah 60 is talking about God's glory being revealed on his people. So while that um, Habakkuk is talking about God's glory just being revealed around the earth, this is very specific that God wants to use his people to display his glory. Uh, and that we ourselves will be the light in the darkness, that people will be drawn to us because they see God's glory upon us. Uh, and so that's what we're praying for in Revival, that God's glory will come to us in a way that is so powerful that uh, people will be drawn to him when they see that. Um, Psalm 63, 1 and 2. Hmm? Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. So here we see the psalmist cry for uh, for God's presence. So a hunger and thirst for God as if he himself is in a place of dryness, in a place of barrenness. Um, and uh, for God's power and glory to be present in his sanctuary. That is God's desire for us as his people, as the temple of the Lord, for his glory and his presence to be amongst us. Um, we'll just look at two verses, Exodus 40, 34 to 38, and then Psalm 26, 8. Not in the notes, no. Exodus 40, 34 to 38. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of Jesus, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle because the cloud rested rest on him. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all the Egypt. But if the cloud was not taken up, and they did not turn till the day that it was taken. So the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle. Fire was over the tabernacle. The sight of all the house of Israel took all the Egyptians. Thank you. You were unmuted, right? I can hear you. Hear you. Online? Okay. Okay. Uh, so um, Isaiah 40, 34 to 38 talks about. Um, the tabernacle being set up in the midst of the people of Israel, right? So God brings Israel out of Egypt. Um, they don't know the presence of God. They don't know this God at all, right? And he gives them instructions for how to build a place where his glory can dwell. And uh, in Exodus 40, before this 34 to 38, is how they actually carry out God's instructions. So Moses has instructions from God about how the tabernacle is to be set up. And he carries out those instructions exactly as God has given it to him. Uh, and finally, once the tabernacle is set up, uh, that crowning moment is God's presence descending upon the tabernacle. Um, so we see right from here that God desired to be present among his people, right? He gave them the instructions of how to build the tabernacle, uh, and then he came down in their midst. Uh, so just looking at that example, we recognize that God desires to be in our midst as a people, as his people. Uh, he desires to fill his house with his glory. And so when we are praying for revival, we again are just preparing ourselves to be ready for what God actually wants to do. God wants to fill us with his glory. He wants for his presence and his power to be in our midst. And we are just saying, OK, Lord, we want to be ready for it. Uh, and we want to align ourselves with your will. Um, and so when we are seeking that out, when we are praying for it, 
we are just aligning ourselves with God's desire. Um, okay, we have one more minute, so we'll just look at uh, Psalm 26, 8, and then we'll close. Psalm 26, verse 8. Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Yeah, so we looked at Exodus where the tabernacle was built and then uh, in Psalms, he's talking about the temple uh, that was built and the presence of God that is in the temple of God. Uh, and so now we today are the temple of God, right? Individually and collectively. And uh, so we are to be that, the carriers of God's presence, carriers of God's glory uh, as individuals and then as a church as well. Um, so we will continue from here tomorrow. Uh, thank you all for joining in.